linguistic, and it, it just goes on and on and on, and it just keeps piling on in these various, uh, actually rather elegant layers. The Mayans and the Egyptians were part of a society that wanted us to find this information out because it's going to come and happen to us, and they wanted to tell us. And well, attention. what are we supposed to do about it? Well, there's the there's the thing. The according to the um, uh, work that uh, Girl cites that goes to a Frenchman by the name of Flossman who translated some hieroglyphics, and he includes the hieroglyphics in his book, so you can go and do the translation yourself if you want. And I have some hieroglyphic dictionaries I can recommend if you're interested. But in any event, uh, people in the past have survived. We know that people have survived past crustal shifts because we know that the crustal shifts have existed. We can find geological evidence of them, and yet here we are, and humans still continue to exist. In fact, there's a great number of us. So we know that this, that in spite of the um, level of chaos and, and problems of the past, in these crustal shifts, humans have pulled through and enough to carry the Yeah, even forward. 5% will make it. We could, we're like a virus. We don't need much. We've got a Petri dish called The carry trade would probably be on the order of 10,000 breeding pairs. That's it. 10, so if you had 20,000 fertile individuals, you could probably make the species uh, reconnect. The problem is the level of civilization is mm. greatly diminished at that level. You need right. several hundred thousand to even come close to maintaining a, you know, a medieval level of civilization to start from. Hmm. So it's going to be rather difficult that way, and that is a real problem. That's what led me to all of this was why, pondering the question, given the nature of the creativity of humans, why have we not made that step in, the, in our uh, incredibly long span as a species? Mm -hmm. Why haven't we made it off of this, this rock? And it's, well, because periodically we get slammed by one of these things that kicks mm. us back to a mm. near Stone Age. This may be part of the universe, and that would also explain why there are not hundreds of thousands of Type uh, 1 civilizations. And it may be that all the solar systems go through this, slamming it back repeatedly mm -hmm. in the same kind of a process, and it's just a natural magnetism refresh sort of a thing of an internal engine kind of a deal. It's so, breeding... Uh, issue you raise uh, brings to mind the story from several days ago of scientists apparently on the verge of making both sperm and eggs human quality from stem cells. In other words, we're not needed anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what they say. You know, I'm sure that they'll succeed too, but it's like, why bother, guys? <laughs> yeah. You know, I know why there's a huge amount of work in, in fertility and infertility these past few years, by the way, and that is because sunspot cycles are related directly to uh, fertility of all, all life on the planet, including humans. And, and the uh, Mayans and the Egyptians also encoded that information in there. I wonder if they had to deal with the same kind of mass planetary toxification. I mean, poisoning. No. And that's, which we are dealing with, and that's why the uh, yeah. well, the, the estrogen uh, attack on, on humankind and amphibians and everything else is creating all kinds of sexual chaos, as you know. I actually would disagree. I think the sun is a primary cause, the primary right. cause, and the level of estrogen, certainly in, in plant-based estrogens in the, social, in the um, infrastructure, is something to be concerned of with. But in general, I would think that it's the the polar cycle of the sun, because the polar cycle of the sun is connected to both the testosterone and the estrogen flow within uh, humans, and it's a 37-day cycle in spite of all evidence to the contrary in any other lunar cycle. And this 37-day cycle is at its weakest point that they've ever been able to measure since mm. we've been able to measure these kind of things in the sun, and it's been degrading noticeably. The Germans did all kinds of measurements in it in the early 30s and were rather shocked about the level of degradation that they noticed in only six years. And then the war came along and stopped their efforts. That Is that regard. why so many of the so-called advanced uh, European cultures are not breeding much anymore? Is there any tie-in there? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it also affects all the species. That's why, for instance, we've had the four-year hiatus mm -hmm. in naturally occurring spawn of oyster types off the, coast of the, off the west coast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. simply not breeding. And a lot of these fertility cycles are directly related to the polar cycles. Very in interesting. The sun. Very interesting. All right, we're uh, about two minutes away from break. Next hour, we're going to talk to Cliff High about the issue of a crustal shift and a massive recharging of the Earth's magnetosphere and what it may or may not do. Some of the scenarios are being are put out there. Uh, Mr. Garrell feels he has. Uh, Absolute certainty of where the safe places are, where the safe places aren't. How many days left, Cliff? Uh, 
1,144 probably, if we're okay. lucky. If if we're lucky. Yeah, we've been lied to so repeatedly by the powers that be that do we trust their calendar or not? They well, were some... the ones that made the uh, Mayan long count end on that day. Yeah. They could have been, you know, <laughs> screwing around with us. I'm not sure if it was uh, Cotterell or not, but someone said that the Mayan calendar was actually two years too long in our view of it. We've been told it's not. It's actually 2010. It's not 2012. I don't know. Who knows? Kalman thinks figure. he knows, and and I think his math is probably the better. Who does? Uh, John Kalman. Oh yeah. And he thinks uh-huh. it's October something, uh, 2011. Mm. And there are a couple of astrological uh, alignment issues that you can factor in there. But the the Pope Gregory went to such great trouble and spent such a fortune on mathematicians in the in the 1500s uh-huh. to make the long count end at 11:11 a.m. on a day whose numbers all add up to 11, which is, you know, 12, 21, 2012. I see. And 11 is their key number for uh-huh. the for the Vatican as well as the Masons, etc. So uh-huh. they went to some trouble to do it, so I think that they at least have some indication that something's going to occur on that day. That's their best bet. Yeah. And they may know a lot more than we do, because I don't believe them when they say they burned all of those uh, Mayan Oh, please. Records. They didn't burn anything. Yeah. No way. No, knowledge is power. And not yeah, yeah. Power. And, and books? Yeah. Sure. No way. I wonder if the Alexandria Library was completely desecrated or not. I never know. And if there is anything under the Giza Plateau by way of a record of the past... Believe me, it has been removed long ago. <laughs> no one's going to tell us, yeah. That's right. All right, back another hour with Mr. Cliff High. Do look at the material at halfpasthuman.com or in the guests section at rents.com. Study up on that, and we'll come back and continue our conversation in just a few minutes. Back with you and Cliff High talking about 2012, what it may or may not mean. Cliff seems to think he's dialed in a pretty interesting scenario, and indeed he has. Again, you're invited to look at the special material in the guest box at rents.com or just go to halfpasthuman.com and you'll find it there. You know, Cliff, people talk about the 12th planet and the Buru and all that coming back, coming back. And in every culture at the very back end of their history is always the cataclysm. Maybe, maybe the question is, is actually sun. But it's not, it's not. We make a lot of idea of a, uh, a, a recurring giant in. or something. Yeah, and something and that came in and disturbed the orbits at this level. Yeah, uh, You should be able to uh, notice that in the orbits years before it showed up, centuries, you would right. know about it. Right. All right. Crustal shift. People right away are going to say, well, all right, uh, Cliff, what about continental drift over the hundreds of millions of years, you know, two inches That's every a supposition. Year. That's never proven. That's just a supposition, and it can mm-hmm. be easily, um, through just simple mental exercises, disputed, at least in some degree. Sure. Imagine mm-hmm. a situation where they, the you follow the academic line that England gradually drifted away from the continent. Well, then the first year that it separated, it moved, according to them, you know, two and a half centimeters. I would maintain that it would fill with dirt. And it would be centuries and centuries and centuries before there was any noticeable parting. And mm-hmm. on the converse side, the only way that such thing could happen uh, and show the conditions that we have would be a very abrupt uh, kind of a, an occurrence. In fact, if we go and we look in the current situation now in uh, Africa over near um, Ethiopia, Somalia, in that region, we've had got a new ocean forming there as a new rift opened up over the course of three weeks and carved out, I think I want to say about 600 kilometers at that point, mm-hmm. of a new super deep trench on the order of the Grand Canyon kind of a trench, mm-hmm. and it happened in the course of weeks. Also, let's note that the um, fourth largest tectonic plate on the planet cracked in the matter of minutes, and that was the Indo-Australian plate that's now two plates, the Indo plate and the Australian plate, mm-hmm. and it cracked in the same earthquake that caused the uh, Banda Aceh tsunami. So such things happen rapidly. And in fact, the more you research this, reading Hapgood and, and others, the, the information keeps pointing to all of this stuff occurring on a so, level of rapidity. 